Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. For the fifth time now, uh, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna is organizing uh, this uh, Biennale panel in Venice now. It is uh, a great success and uh, at first I want to thank uh, uh, those who are helping us uh, for so long time uh, in Vienna from the Biennale team. Uh, Matteo Giannasi and Elisabetta, thank you very much for your support. Uh, we really appreciate that. And we will not stop. Uh, <clears throat> thank you also for the organizing uh, team. First of all, Sanford Quinte, who organized this uh, panel. Uh, and uh, very welcome to our distinguished guests, which who will introduce later on. So our topic today is uh, reality in the broad sense. Uh, reality, virtual reality, beyond the virtuality. So I ask myself, what has this to do with uh, the general topic of the, this year's Biennale. Uh, is there any connection with uh, free spaces? I think there is. So sometimes uh, free space is a reality, but even more often free spaces are virtual spaces, and we will see what uh, free spaces be, will be in the future and if there will be any. Actually free or actually reality of course has something to do with perception, with the ability and the willingness to perceive things and facts. Things and facts. The ability and willingness. Uh, and I want to give you two thoughts uh, which came into my mind uh, for these uh, uh, ideas uh, and these uh, part of the topic. The ability to perceive needs uh, tools, sensual tools. So what will happen in the future in terms of uh, genetic engineering uh, neuromedical implantations and engineering. So we now know uh, the common sensual tools we have to perceive reality, if we are able to perceive. Uh, and uh, in the future, we will have new tools. Think about uh, body implants, think about eye implants, think about brain implants those tools will totally change the opportunities of perceptions and maybe they will change or certainly these new tools will change reality or rather realities and uh, the next thing is uh, the willingness of uh, perception the willingness to perceive uh, we all know this is a topic mainly in politics. Uh, uh, politicians often are not really, not really willing to perceive facts and matters. Uh, imagine three maps of our globe. Three maps. The one map is showing those regions in the world with the highest density of population. The second map is showing the regions all over the globe with the highest rate, growth rate of uh, people. And the third map is showing those regions uh, which will be mostly infected, heavily infected by climate change. And if you lay these three maps uh, over each other, we will see that uh, 
these are really congruent areas. So we will realize, realize a reality that will change our urbanized and increasingly urbanizing situation all over the world, but mainly in those parts of the world uh, which uh, are those uh, mainly richer fields of the world. So I think both uh, ideas are brought now, uh, the changing situations with technology and changing uh, with population and climate change will and do have something to do, or let's say should have something to do with architecture. The question is if architects do see this in the same direction. I wish you a fruitful and inspiring discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And and I forgot one very important person to thank uh, Roswitha Janowski Fritz for organizing uh, all things for the last week. Thank you, Roswitha. You did a tremendous job. Thank you, Gerald. And uh, welcome. Before uh, I very briefly will introduce our esteemed panelists, uh, I have to say that when Sanford wrote us this email, with uh, the theme or topic to be discussed today, we were not fully sure about what non-ordinary reality might mean. And uh, therefore, as a kind of beginning joke, I found the, play, uh, the term explained in the Encyclopedia of Shamanism by Christina Pratt, Volume 2, saying that non-ordinary reality is ordinary reality as it is perceived from an altered state of consciousness. Non-ordinary reality is the aspect of life and the world that is normally invisible, which is perceived by the shaman while in trance. Also called the spirit world, the invisible world, spirit realm, dream time, and the other world. But I don't think that we're going into that mystic, uh, esoteric set. Or will we? Don't be so sure. Okay. <laughs> For I rather thought, and this is another quote I'd like to read out by uh, Manuel de Landa ending his uh, fantastic book, uh, a thousand years of nonlinear history when saying changing our way of thinking about the world is necessary first step but it is by no means sufficient it will need to destratify reality itself and we must do so without the guarantee of a golden age ahead knowing full well the dangers and possible restratifications we might face and uh, I must say I'm very happy that Sanford will uh, do a kind of co-moderation in this very distinctive manners. Um, first of all, on your very right, on your very left, I'm sorry, it is Kuta Nayata, New York-based architect. Um, you have your practice in Brooklyn, and uh, Kuta has been a faculty member of University of Pennsylvania since 2013. He previously held teaching positions at Pratt Institute, Cornell, Columbia University, and he was a fellow at Princeton University where he received his Master's of Architecture with distinction in 2004. Welcome, Kutan. <laughs> Next to him, it's Agnieszka Kurant. He is an interdisciplinary conceptual artist who examines how complex social, economic, and cultural systems can operate in ways that confuse distinctions between fiction and reality or nature and culture. Her work investigates the economy of the invisible, in which immaterial and imaginary entitles fictions, phantoms, and emergent processes influence political and economic systems. Collaborating with professionals from various fields, such as biologists, anthropologists, cartographers, economists, computer engineers, and roboticists, current probes, the speculations, and exploits the of capitalism by analyzing phenomena such as collective intelligence, emergence, virtual capital, immaterial and digital labor, artificial intelligence, crowdsourcing, evolution of memes, civilizations and social movements, artificial societies and in energy circuits. Many of her works emulate nature and behave like living organisms, self-organized complex systems and bachelor machines. Should I? Yeah. Welcome, Agnieszka.
Andrew Witt is a professor, assistant professor in practice of architecture at Harvard GSD and co-founder with Tobias Nolte of Certain Measures, an office for design science working in the intersection of architecture, mathematics, and culture. The current research considers the space for design between human and machine perception. Certain Measures was a 2017 finalist for the Stumptobel Awards for both young professionals and applied innovation and the project Mind the Scrap will be featured in the upcoming exhibition Coding the Word at the Centre Pompidou, opening in June 2018. Welcome, Andrew. <laughs> Barbara Imhoff is an internationally active space architect, design researcher and educator. She is the co-founder and CEO of Liquify Systems Group, an interdisciplinary team comprising engineers, architects, designers and scientists she works in the research and development projects that deal with space flight parameters such as living with limited resources, minimal transformable spaces and resource conserved systems. All aspects imperative to sustainability. Heavily teaching around, welcome Barbara. Brian Boygon is an artist, writer, theorist and professor at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Design at the University of Toronto. Boygon's research concerns span the seminal last three decades in which analog and digital modalities confronted each another. His work centers on the problem of what he terms locomotive design raging from the multimedia days of the early 90s in which he developed a proto-avatar environment called the Cartoon Regulators up through the current project, which I believe you will present today, a series of speculative environment entitled the Into Opera. Welcome, Brian. <laughs> and I believe you're all familiar with Sanford, to whom I might pass the microphone now. Um, can I use that, rather? Well, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our panel on the no longer simple problem of reality. Now, it's true, reality is a, it's a very quotidian term, it's a vague term. Uh, who would have guessed that it would become a term that would become so uh, problematized uh, in, in, in our current history? Um, part of the idea, and because we, we have a very loaded panel, uh, you know, incredible guests with a hell of a lot to say, none of whom will get around really to communicating uh, the full force of what they could uh, offer on this particular topic. And it's meant, of course, to provoke a conversation, a discussion, uh, an event, a, a set of meetings, um, which I hope might uh, develop into a, a more pointed, I always do that, something about the way I, I'll get a distance from the mic, uh, that might end up in a, uh, a, a kind of a more pointed intervention, public intervention in the form perhaps of a publication or a book uh, around this topic. So how did that even come about? Uh, anyone involved in art or design today, and increasingly those involved in thinking about perception and knowledge, as, uh, as Gerald put the two problems together, which I, I agree with entirely. In other words, how we use our nervous system to engage and transform our world must now begin to activate this once self-evident term, reality, as the frighteningly unstable object that it is, or that it has uh, become. Now, where did the topic come from? It came from a quick conversation that we had at the Angavanta uh, some months ago, probably end of last year, where the topic of, for example, virtual reality and augmented reality, topics which are, uh, uh, which have in a way entered into and, and begun to, in, in fact, pervade the studios at the Angavanta uh, and have moved into, you know, uh, questions of the design methodologies as a further complication of the age-long problem of the human sensory integration into and with its environment. I say that it's, uh, it's an age-long thing because 
This problem is in fact never solved. It is never solved, but it is design's perennial ethical and philosophical problem uh, to engage. So the terms really have changed, but in fact it is arguably uh, the same problem that architecture and art have always been engaged in is the, is the transformation of external entities in order to change, let's say, or to affect internal environments, that's to say, inside of our heads. Which is really where reality, I suppose, gets made. It's where it exists. So, in addition to that, the reason why the topic interested me is that there are a host of discourses being paradoxically maintained today in art and design circles that take up various postures in relation to new and classical doctrines of realism. That term realism is coming back in a variety of ways today. And it struck me as an opportune time to force that this, this clash of doctrines and developments to meet with a view, to meet one another um, with a view to an eventual reckoning in an era when both fraud and reality are tacitly, even surreptitiously, seeking an equal ontological status. That sounds like a lot of jargon, but these are terms that are becoming increasingly common today. That term ontology, again and again, we're beginning to hear it, which is the, the study uh, of being. Uh, and it is precisely because, that word ontology is precisely because reality is beca has become problematic. Whose responsibility is it, if not ours, to safeguard human psychic ecology, to fight back by generating forceful and convincing distinctions where the forces of social and economic organization are systematically removing them? So the argument I would make is that these are developments uh, that are tacitly taking place in our culture around us. And thinking about and talking about reality and developing a language to grasp it precisely when it is vanishing, if you like, precisely when it is leaving uh, our grasp. So what's the non-ordinary all about? For the title of today's panel, I know it's weird, yes, I chose the clumsy term non-ordinary with the justification that it has been in use for the last 120 years in philosophical psychology since the time of William James as a kind of a placeholder that has reserved for human experience, no, as a placeholder that I wrote this on the airplane flying in here today. Um, uh, reserved for human experience and for human destiny, but also for human excellence. Access to knowledge and experience that exists outside of and beyond the routines sanctioned by the rote organization of everyday life. The idea, of course, as it was invoked uh, already um, by, by Florian, um, that there is, and by, I will say this also by Gerald Bast, and that is, is that the question is, is yes, what is it that we are permitted to experience? What is it that we are permitted to sense? Uh, it is a political question. I wanted to quote a couple of things from James, William James's book uh, on the varieties of religious experience. He says that our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, separated from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. Now we have, of course, we tend to forget that. We tend to forget just what is available 
to human sentience and human experience outside of the incredibly narrow forms that are prepared for it, that are, pre that are prepared for us, if you like, by, um, by our, our culture, by our economic systems, by our thought systems, by our technological uh, universe, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He goes on, he says, no account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. At any rate, they forbid a premature closing of our accounts with reality. Now, this is what he's arguing in 1902 when he published his book on um, the varieties of, he called it the varieties of religious experience, but in many, case, in many ways he was really talking about what are the limits of human experience, um, and in that sense, the concept of the non-ordinary. So, I was in Frankfurt yesterday at an event with the German neurophysiologist Wolf Singer to discuss topics similar to today's. During our exchange, I referred to, and I quote myself here, he says, I referred to the crises we are facing today in our sensory and experiential worlds. At which point, Singer interrupted me to ask entirely innocently for clarification on what exactly these crises were that to which I was referring. To a neurobiologist, humans, at the best of times, sample at most 4%, that's Singer's estimate, of concrete reality and simply invent or fill in the remaining 96%. I replied to him that from the perspective of historians, social theorists, and designers and artists, the current crisis, if there is one, has to do with the shift in the 4% no longer uniquely or even predominantly information regarding processes in the natural or even material world, but synthetic, mathematically generated, machine-synthesized sensorial data. Our sensorium is being transformed around us, and we barely are able to grasp or even to form a position from which we can understand exactly how it is being flattened, reduced, etc., and uh, limited. He then began to nod emphatically and recounted the following story. So he told a story to us about a very bizarre and very troubling experience he had on an airplane many years ago. He was flying home from a conference in uh, Boston, flying back to Germany, and it was uh, relatively soon after an LSD trip that he had taken. And uh, he had been reading, as many people do, uh, before doing those types of explorations, the work of Aldous Huxley, particularly The Doors of Perception, in which Huxley describes the appearance of lobsters in his hallucinations. And what uh, Singer saw a couple of seats ahead of him in the uh, aisle in the airplane, he said he saw a lobster walking across the, the tables. And he immediately thought he, had, he was undergoing a psychotic break. And he said that he became extremely agitated and extremely troubled. And at some point, he just got up to shake his body loose. And he walked by, and he absolutely insisted he saw the hallucination on his neighbor's table, and he reached across and he touched it. And it was a real lobster. <laughs> In those days, I guess they were still encouraging people to buy lobsters from New England and fly home to Germany with them, and they were alive, and they were still selling them in the airport. Now, the point, though, of course, I mean, Singer is, of course, not a, you know, he's not an insignificant uh, neurobiologist, but, of course, the problem, of course, is where reality resides and how fragile it is, if you like, and how it is constituted. And there was an ensuing conversation about cross-modal uh, um, uh, confirmation or override the way, for example, information from one sense or system of senses um, requires sometimes confirmation or 
in fact, is sometimes in conflict uh, with others. But of course, it really tells us, in a sense, just how complex it is, if you like, our home inside of our perceptual uh, apparatus. It seems to me there was one more topic I'd like to bring up that, uh, that came to be uh, in our discussion uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, and that was that um, neurobiologists uh, who are interested in the construction and the assembly of perception and how we come to believe we are receiving and producing knowledge of the external world. Um, and in this case, I was very happy to hear it, that it is definitely part of Wolf Singer's explanatory apparatus to rely on evolutionary arguments. Um, it is not always the case, but I personally believe that it is a very important factor to understand how it is, to understand who we are, in a way, is to understand the conditions in the external world that produced us, the pressures, if you like, that made us who we are, and which endowed us with our capacities, if you like, for sensing the universe and shaping and producing knowledge, which is really what designers, ultimately, we could say, do. He made an argument, however, that it was precise, that it was primarily what he refers to as the mesoscopic uh, scale of reality, that's to say the scale, let's say, between things that we can almost not see, like a very, very tiny baby cockroach, up to the level, let's say, of buildings. Uh, that's to say, it is the scale of which human perception in its most routine and trite and maybe platitudinous um, uh, level is capable of immediately sensing. And I would point out to you that Singer is not immune to a fundamental bias in neurobiology toward vision as the main modality in which we pick up the world. And it's very important, in fact, to correct that bias. But nonetheless, we'll leave it at that. His argument is that that is precisely what the human nervous system is, has evolved, if you like, and that there are aspects of the rest of reality, shall we say, or of the universe, which are basically left and forever to be opaque to us, except, of course, through techniques of conceptualization and science, etc. But I think that this is not true. Uh, the human nervous system, the mammalian nervous system, is, uh, is evolved from uh, much earlier life forms, and the very first sensing apparatus was simply single-celled uh, uh, animals, uh, which uh, sensed the universe through chemotaxis, that's to say through chemical sensing, to figure out which things were noxious and that they had to retreat from, or which things were to be ingested, uh, or which were simply friendly environments for the exchange of nutrients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, that, of course, is a sensing apparatus that takes place almost at the molecular scale. And we could go to the opposite direction as well. But what is interesting, because the topic is virtual reality, and the question, what, in fact, are the opportunities that a virtual reality can afford us, rather than simply placing us more, shall we say, um, more deeply, more inescapably within the routines of economic, let's say, rationality as it's developing around us, which is the main driver, I would say, of virtual reality machinery and techniques, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, they could provide us, allow the nervous system an intermediary where these uh, these aspects of human sensing potential, which are simply lost through, uh, through the ways in which our senses are channeled in the contemporary world, which could, in fact, uh, permit uh, a whole kind of, you could almost say, a whole kind of a whole renaissance of the exploration of human sentience and would produce, I would say, for us, almost a political program of how one uses these new technologies and puts them at the service of human, let's say, liberty or expansion, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say that that quote meant almost derisively that came from the shamanistic tradition is not altogether unuseful 
let's say, for us today. Okay, so we can begin. Kutan, would you? Oh, you know, I should let the audience know that we uh, had to deprive our uh, panelists of the very necessary opportunity, let's say, or ability to basically present images to you so that you would understand what their labor in life is. None of these people who produce these extraordinary images and environments, et cetera, and plastic, are, they're all coming to you with words and language. And, it's, and for some it's a challenge, and for others it's a wonderful opportunity, and for many it's going to simply be a problem. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I did, I did, but you know, it's also true that as we know when we study physics is the smaller the doorway, the greater the speed at the people that pass through it. All right, on that note, I have another lobster story I'll, okay. I'll get to in a minute. Oh, uh, we br bring out your lobster stories, everybody. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I think one thing you said, uh, Sanford, that uh, maybe taps into uh, precisely what I'm going to talk about. It's uh, if I'm kind of rephrasing it correctly, transformation of external entities uh, into internal entities and back out. And seems to me I would, in relationship to our discipline, I could um, call that representation, uh, the problem of uh, representation. Somehow getting the architectural thought, getting the design thought uh, yeah, out, of, out of us into the world and uh, project the world with that, um, hopefully to change. Um, I think the um, question of representation is uh, probably the I don't know, single most in interesting topic for me uh, in the current uh, sea of architecture and design. Uh, we are at a funny moment where uh, there is no singular direction in architecture. There is no kind of a center of gravity. Uh, there are multiple gravities attitudes in terms of uh, how we kind of uh, envision the future reality uh, of, of our environment. Um, but questions of representation is uh, kind of interesting, uh, especially, let's say, after, uh, let's say, the slowing down of the digital project. Uh, we find ourselves dealing with um, kind of renderings through all conventions. Um, uh, we, we're uh, kind of very comfortable with renderings of uh, drawings, renderings of uh, uh, models. Uh, the only thing the discipline is not comfortable with uh, is a rendering of photorealistic images images that convey uh, a future plausibility um, of a project, of a proposition, uh, as it appears. Um, somehow it's uh, the thing that we trust the most uh, looking into the world, uh, we trust the least in terms of how we project our ideas uh, back towards the world. Um, and I, I, I think this is a super interesting problem uh, because it usually goes in two ways. Uh, either it's uh, fully dismissed as access to real, or it's kind of seen as, uh, let's say, uh, uh, generic, uh, flat, literal reality that nobody wants to engage, or it's uh, kind of uninteresting, uh, at the least. Um, but realism has a, has a deep history, and it quickly deviates from uh, literalness, uh, even as far as uh, 17th century. Um, so the lobster story goes like this. Um, the, um, Kind of, uh, there are a group of painters in 17th century in Netherlands. Uh, um, kind of, they're, they're not really respected painters. Um, they're kind of doing this as, let's say, in night jobs, moonlighters, uh, painting still life uh, compositions. Um, when you look at them, they're incredibly detailed. Uh, there's uh, usually an open oyster, a peeled lemon, and uh, inevitably an upside down lobster. Um, and they all compose the scene of a plausible reality that uh, um, we can all look at, walk by very quickly, and maybe not even pay any attention. Uh, it appears as composition. But if you really begin to think about the medium through which it's created and uh, how long it took to make a painting, you realize it's actually kind of a, um, an abstraction of parts, a collage, if you will, where the seams kind of disappear to produce uh, a plausible appearance of reality. 
the whole thing is an absolute fiction. Uh, there, none, none of these things kind of existed there at the same time. Uh, none of the objects kind of occupied the same uh, territory space relationality at the same time. Uh, but the way it's been depicted uh, uh, begins to appear uh, that it's plausible. Now, this is happening all the while uh, realistic painting is obviously uh, in full force depicting fa fantastic <coughs> scenes of the divine. So uh, there are kind of two branches you can take some, somehow re realism in the service of uh, producing recognizable consumable imagery uh, that pushes towards fantasy and realism that produces uh, a kind of everydayness, a background, if you will, that uh, uh, one could easily overlook. Um, and of course, this kind of transitions through uh, French realism, through Corbet's work uh, in the kind of depiction of the everyday. Um, and it opens up new aesthetic categories. Um, somehow, aesthetics no longer is understood as, as beauty, uh, but other potentials, other experiences emerge as uh, artist expression, but also uh, kind of the receiver's perception of uh, uh, the possibilities of the world. Um, begin to think about the ugly, the sublime, uh, the grotesque, um, and of course the strange. Um, the strange here, um, kind of interesting moment, because if we kind of stop for a moment to think that realism equates reality, uh, but realism is an aesthetic argument regarding uh, reality and its representation, there's kind of a delamination. There is room for uh, interpretation, there's room for fiction that allows one to construct, uh, let's say, um, this uh, inner entity, as uh, um, Sanford was suggesting, uh, to project back out to the world. Um, and, I, and, and I think uh, maybe the word um, reality is becoming um, kind of guilty of that fiction lately. And I wonder we need a new word, uh, like factuality, uh, in, instead of reality, uh, to kind of let kind of reality free to live its uh, true potential. Um, photography has been uh, dealing with this question quite a while. Um, and um, kind of uh, the moment it became kind of scientific um, proof of what reality looks like, uh, it was very quickly established that there are freedoms within the medium to uh, express other potentials, especially lately, uh, the field of photography. It's hard to call it photography. Let's um, there is nothing being grafted through photons on a paper through chemical uh, uh, um, kind of process. Let's call it the constructed image. Uh, photographers like um, artists like, let's say, Thomas Demand, uh, Jeff Wall, Gregory Crutzen, uh, producing imagery that begins to produce through different mediums, different techniques, um, appearances of the real that one, one might completely ignore uh, at first sight. But again, upon close examination, uh, while you are made to feel real sensations, real reactions to what you see, uh, you begin to realize that uh, none of what you see is actual. Uh, it's an abstract construction of collaged parts. It's a collaboration between abstraction and realism. When abstraction and realism uh, kind of begins to operate together, interesting uh, stories uh, come up. Uh, real, kind of what you're looking at is no longer burdened with um, kind of proving the factual. Uh, no longer it kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, flees the necessity to access uh, through fully uh, uh, f for uh, through full abstraction. Um, w what's kind of uh, interesting as it relates to architecture is um, we all go through this exercise uh, in the way we work and project our work uh, into the world, but uh, we uh, don't take it as seriously as uh, these discipline, uh, the discipline of uh, photography or let's say constructed image uh, in the way we really engage this uh, powerful tool. Um, for me, I think uh, um, kind of uh, this, this domain of uh, realism within architecture through photorealistic image uh, is one thing that we're skirting very carefully uh, far away. And I think uh, there's a really interesting project there uh, to take on, carry on forward to uh, kind of explore uh, other potentials of what, uh, what people assume to be real. Um, I'm just going to close uh, with a quote as well. Um, but uh, it's going to be from my eight-year-old eight daughter. 
and um, she plays this uh, uh, she plays this game Roblox, um, and uh, her, her her kind of uh, profile has this statement which I didn't know she wrote. Uh, it says, "Reality is a, reality is so beautiful and has mysteries going along with it." Now, b b besides kind of the cheerful optimism of an eight-year-old, uh, which you know I, I, I truly admire. Um, the sense uh, that uh, the reality is not uh, purely a factual fixed instance, but it has a lot of unknowns uh, that uh, one can begin to kind of anticipate uh, is a fascinating thing to me. Thank you, Thank you very much, Kutan. And yes, may we ask you to proceed? So I would like to refer to the questions of transformation of a social, complex social realities. And I, I want to talk about social realities, phantom realities. And um, uh, I would like to talk about um, a couple of examples and my point of departure for, for my recent um, body of work. And um, so um, I've been thinking a lot about um, the ways in which uh, uh, the world in, in which we live now when information is newly free, um, social capital um, begins to slowly replace uh, financial capital. Um, and just in a similar way that uh, coal, oil or gas are extracted from the natural world, uh, today our social energies are captured and quantified in uh, different ways. Um, and uh, well, social reality is um, molded by various agencies, uh, different types of extra statecraft platforms, uh, that generate a, a lot of fictions, private corporations um, which uh, uh, um, acquire personhood, um, um, offshore finance and uh, fictional companies that are responsible for most important financial transactions in the world. Um, and um, I've been thinking a lot um, about how uh, there, we're living in a moment where um, a lot of people have a sense that with the use of algorithms we can, um, that reality becomes um, controllable and computable. And I think that there is a lot of uh, kind of like a battle between these two positions, like the, 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 um, the ability to capture, to, to calculate and to compute and uh, control every single aspect of, um, uh, of our um, reality and the, realis the realization that actually um, at the same time we're living in the world of uncomputables, that especially social realities, co complex constructed social realities uh, produce um, a lot of um, extremely rare events, black swans, situations that still despite all the algorithms that are being um, uh, evolved, um, it's impossible to um, uh, to control it and to predict it, and, and this is actually something very hopeful for me. So I um, I would like to uh, talk about uh, very briefly about a couple of um, uh, um, examples of fictions, collective fictions, or or, or um, social phenomena. Um, uh, I would like to um, also refer to um, um, an idea about how fictions um, gradually um, are um, becoming um, more important components of, of politics and economy. And um, um, I want to um, uh, um, bring back the, the idea of, um, presented by uh, Yuval Harari, the Israeli historian and anthropologist that uh, actually the way that societies could evolve um, and self-organize and develop was on the basis of three types of fictions, money, gods, and laws. Um, and um, so I would like to uh, very briefly talk about uh, uh, four, uh, four types of, of social experiments uh, that, uh, that have been pretty inspiring for my recent practice and, and where this kind of led. So, um, and probably many of you are familiar with these experiments. Um, uh, so, just very briefly, um, uh, the most recent experiment that I 
uh, want to mention is something called PLACE, which was a collaborative project uh, and social experiment hosted on the social networking site Reddit, and it began, began on April, April Fool's Day in 2017. This experiment involved an online canvas of one million pixel squares located at subreddit called Our Place, um, which registered users could edit by changing the color of a single pixel from a 16 color palette. After each pixel was placed, a timer prevented the user from, pricing, uh, from placing any pixels for, for a period of 5 to 20 minutes. So about um, um, 1 million unique users edited the canvas over 72 hours, and there were various phenomena that emerged in this um, environment. A lot of them were n not particularly interesting, but, uh, but uh, uh, visually, you know, it, 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 at some point there was, for example, a, a kind of self-organized black void. So there was some kind of like a black hole in the middle of this collective canvas. There was all self-organized. Um, there were also a lot of fictional characters and internet memes that were kind of collectively shaped. Um, uh, second um, social experiment I want to mention is Twitch Plays Pokemon, uh, which was a social experiment and a, a channel on a video game that was live streaming um, through website Twitch, and it consisted of crowdsourced attempt to play Pokemon video games by parsing comments sent by users through the channel's chat room. So it actually did won like a Guinness World Record for having the most participants in a single player online video game with 1.1 million, million participants. Um, and uh, um, two, very briefly, two more experiments. One is to take, uh, take care of my plant, please take care of my plant, which is a bot which is controlled, also on subreddit, controlled by users. So every morning at about 8 a.m. the bot will make a new post asking if people want to water the plant. In that daily post you can comment with yes or no to vote on whether we should water the plant that day. Every evening at about 6 p.m. the bot will tally the votes from, from that day and either water the plant or not. And it's it's online, you can go to the website. And um, and on a like a more global scale and a like a political scale, another social experiment, in this case of a Chinese government, so social credit score. Uh, so China, as many of you probably heard, is trying to uh, maybe find an alternative for the class system and uh, is developing um, uh, a social credit score, which is an initiative um, for a na national reputation system intended to assign a social credit rating to every citizen based on government data regarding their economic and social status. It works as a mass, mass surveillance tool and uses big data analysis technology. So by 2020, China plans to assign each of its 1.4 billion citizens a social credit score that will de uh, determine where people rank in society. So it, for example, people can be uh, ranked for uh, jaywalking, uh, driving poorly, smoking in um, uh, places where it's not allowed, or, um, and the, uh, I don't know, returning a, not returning a book to a library, and more serious crimes. And this can affect their ability to receive um, mortgage, uh, their slow, slow their internet speeds, and uh, People can be prohibited from, uh, you know, sending kids to a certain schools and so on and so on. Um, so um, uh, I uh, so all these phenomena uh, uh, made me um, uh, think about well, obviously how our ca social capital is being harvested and, and exploited, mostly without our knowledge, uh, but how this maybe could be subverted in a, in a, in a, in a to construct new realities, social realities that are uh, bottom-up, self-organized, unpredictable, and how it's already happening today. So um, so just two short words about the first project I did called Assembly Line, uh, which I recently developed at MIT with the um, uh, AI um, uh, computer science lab, um, where basically we worked with the workers of the Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk, Turk platform, which is essentially the something that will is attempting to replace the working class or create the working class of the future and create a crowdsourced, um, um, dispersed, um, highly alienated and exploitative working class where people all over the world are completing minor uh, tasks that are remunerated usually um, less than a dollar per hour and it amounts to very often some kind of um, aggregated or um, assembled um, c content, for example, uh, such as um, uh, Google translation or tagging images. So I um, 
I uh, worked with scientists there to, to develop a series of works that are crowdsourced to this platform. Uh, we asked uh, the, the workers to take their own photographs, their self-portraits, and then we aggregated or amalgamated this uh, self thousands or tens of thousands of the self-portraits into um, collective collective port uh, portraits that are sold in the art market and uh, then it's a way of siphoning off the money from the art market and the profits are shared among the uh, among the workers. Um, I also developed a series of drawings based on the same um, uh, principle in collaboration with my partner John Manick who's present here also based on this sh uh, basically um, profit sharing system and um, um, second project that I very briefly want to uh, talk about is inspired by yet another social phenomenon that affects this kind of hybridization and um, of reality and um, instances of augmented reality of source so um, I want to talk um, very briefly about animal internet uh, uh, changes in the uh, this global force um, and uh, of the, and extra regulatory platforms that I was uh, talking about are paired with a paradigm shift in the human understanding of nature and uh, the reality of the, the, this complexity of, 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 of nature that we're experiencing. So um, new, new total colonization of nature prompts the emergence of virtual heterotopias, such as the extraterritorial phenomenon of what scientists refer to as animal internet. Some 50,000 creatures around the globe, including whales, leopards, flamingos, bats, and snails, are equipped with digital tracking devices and can be followed on animal tracker apps. And um, a lot of scientists are placing cameras in forests or in steppes uh, um, in, in, in the Arctic uh, to film completely unaware, completely wild animals. Um, and we can actually learn interesting things about our economic or political reality. For example, elephants in Sri Lanka could warn us about future tsunamis, as it turns out. Toads can anticipate earthquakes, such as the one in L'Aquila in Italy in 2009. Tracking geese altitude could forecast large-scale avalanches. And an Ebola epidemic could be predicted by fruit bats. Um, with, the, with the ascendance of the animal internet, hundreds of thousands of people Oh, maybe not. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, around the world start to experience nature in a different way, and I think it's very interesting speaking about you know virtualities of reality. So people are experiencing nature in front of their computer screens. Um, and these webcams installed by scientists in jungles, plains, and savannas allow people to, to experience animals um, and create Facebook pages uh, with 1,000 followers for, for animals. And this produces this kind of hybrid augmented reality in which animals are perceived not as abstract images, but, but as autonomous individuals with inherent value and backstories. And um, so, uh, you know, they, they have this wildlife in the, in the forest, and at the same time, they become the protagonists of these narratives, and Facebook pages and fan pages, they're being given names. So it's like a kind of combination between second life and, and nature. And, uh, so drawing on all these phenomena, I kind of imagine like thinking about uh, uh, social movements, uh, the reality of social movements. I imagine like a collective Tamagotchi that um, could be hovering between nature and culture. And as you all know, Tamagotchis were developed in Japan in the 90s, and they were this egg-shaped handheld digital toys that imitating live organisms. And they had to be regularly nourished, pet, and walked. And actually, what is really interesting is that there have been 76 million Tamagotchis Tamagotchis sold to date, a nation's worth. So I imagined what would happen if all the Tamagotchi owners took care of just one single Tamagotchi, an artificial collective organism such as a slime mold. Um, so this organism, like a dispersed society, would be powered by the decisions and actions of thousands of people around the world. Social movement actually could be re rendered as the physical movement and behavior of this hybrid creature. And as we know, since the 1960s, economies and social scientists have used computer simulations and agent-based models to, to think about, to, to, to uh, uh, create virtual models, so socioeconomic models of phenomena observed in society. For example, in, um, at the Santa Fe Institute in the 1990s, um, 
uh, Robert Axel and Joshua Epstein created something called uh, the Sugarscape, and it was based on like imitating the behavior of small people, um, uh, forging on um, something crossover between uh, food, fuel, and and. Um, and money, um, and so I was thinking about like how to co combine this kind of artificial society models with Tamagotchi and with what's happening with the in the in the realm of, of this um, animal internet. So um, uh, Adam, as well as at MIT, we created this project um, called Animal Internet, where that kind of combines all the things I've been just talking about. Um, and uh, so the uh, the project consists of four webcams, and you can find this uh, online. Actually, it was a commission for. Uh, San Francisco uh, MoMA, and it's still online. Um, there are four webcams broadcasting. Two of them are broadcasting live um, from uh, one from the jungle, and it's uh, showing a wild tiger. Another one is showing a, a polar bear in the Arctic. And these are two real webcams. And the other two realities we constructed at MIT. So one of them was uh, crowdsourced to all the workers of the Amazon Mechanical Turk, Turk platform. So the workers were asked to send information about how they currently feel, um, uh, whether they are tired, energized, depressed, um, anxious, and all these um, behaviors were aggregated and they were powering the behavior of an um, fictional artificial animal that was placed uh, like a was it like a, f a fake fur but looking very real in a constructed uh, nature environment at MIT, but an environment con constructed especially for this webcam. So as far as the viewers are concerned, that there's no difference between this environment and the other ones, um, and the animal behavior basically moves and is can be watched online and because essentially you know at the point where um uh, we we don't really need the designate. We don't need the, rea the reality. We can just watch this this webcam essentially. So um, so this was one webcam, and the other webcam is uh, based on um, a Twitter scraper and a kind of like an artificial society model that we created based on uh, different hashtags of protest movements around the world. Everything from like Black Lives Matter, um, Indivisible to Catalonia protests and BDS and um, and other movements, and uh, how this energy social energy is actually changing from positive and negative, from frustration to stagnation and so on. And this was powering a swarm of gerbils, making a little bit of a, of a um, relationship with the gerbils that were part of the installation at Software Exhibition at the Jewish Museum. So, um, and basically they are like live online and um, uh, I was, uh, to conclude, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, this, this project, Animal Internet, um, is relating to the fact that um, scarcely any part of nature is currently untouched by human colonization and exploitation. And in response, humans move toward ever more elaborate forms of engineered nature. Nature becomes a construction, a platform, and a source of profit like, like any other. So here I imagine the end result, a uh, kind of science fiction reality, in which um, um, the entertainment industry crosses over into the production of ecotourism at scale, where simulated natural environments are accessible only online and operated by offshore workers. Animal, animal Internet is a manufactured model of the natural world created by humans and watched by other humans. And in a way, planet Earth can be considered as a co this kind of cooperative Tamagotchi, a crossover between nature and culture, a collective intelligence organism powered by aggregated social energies um, that global ecological movements are trying together to protect. So basically, I'm, in my current work, I'm interested in how can we harvest in a positive way um, social energies and convert them in various forms from uh, actual, actual energies, both kinetic, thermal, solar, but also like in, in a form of capital. How can we kind of harvest the social capital and not only exploit it or allow it to be exploited, but to create realities where uh, this social capital can be used towards something um, positive or, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very happy with the way that the discussion has been furnished thus far, and I'd like to actually tease out a couple of themes and maybe take them a little bit further, especially this notion of collectivity and perception. Um, the relationship of sort of like maps to that and uh, these altered or dream states I think we'll all see sort of resurface. 
So I wanted to particularly consider the subjective experience and non-experience of reality, and not in terms of a specific subject, but in terms of all subjects combined in aggregate into this sort of like master view of reality. Uh, since we can present no digital image to images today, I'll propose a series of mental pictures, which I beg your indulgence to construct. Uh, the first is actually an image of images. In his 1757 painting, Modern Rome, Giovanni Paolo Panini depicts a voluminous neoclassical enfilade gallery encrusted with dozens of nested paintings of then contemporary Roman buildings. This self-similar collection of images within an image is as close uh, as possible to a Pinterest board of enlightenment cla classicism as one is likely to find in the 18th century. Each frame is a window into distinct vision of architecture. It's a catalog of spaces, but it's also a horde of dozens of realities simultaneously experienced. Mechanical means of image making intensified the hoarding of images and the assembly of their cataloged collections. Uh, so since the advent of photography, um, automatic machines have transcribed selective records of particular exclusionary subspectra of reality. So this 4% rule I thought was very interesting because also the machines that we use to record reality are also, you know, extract certain subsets um, of reality in, a, um, in order to transcribe them. So photography was voluminously serial and suggested a new scale and quality of visual catalogs of reality. Uh, with the photograph, and particularly with its close cousin, the stereoscope, so you're all familiar with this, um, well, maybe not everyone, but so this uh, says sort of <laughs> the idea of the stereoscope, right? The stereoscope is two photographs taken at a slight interocular distance used to construct um, what was sometimes termed a solid photograph. Uh, with these two, we can actually redefine what it means to be a library. Once a repository for mere knowledge, it could be reconceived as an index for sensational spatial experiences and sensual realities. Uh, in 1856, the polymath um, Oliver Wendell Holmes sort of envisioned such a library. Uh, quote, the consequence of stereoscopy will, will soon be an enormous collection of forms, um, such an enormous collection of forms that they'll, be have to be, they'll have to be classified and arranged in vast libraries as books are now. The time will come when a, uh, someone who wishes to see any object, natural or artificial, will go to the Imperial, National, or City Stereographic Library and call for its skin or form. Uh, he used this term, this sort of estranging term, skin, as he would for a book in any common library. Uh, we do now distinctly propose the creation of a comprehensive and systematic stereographic library where all people can find the special forms they particularly desire to see as artists, scholars, mechanics, architects or any other capacity, close quote. So digital technology amplifies further this reciprocity uh, between imagination and catalog. We can now comprehensively con catalog almost any imaginable data, sounds, images, spaces, textures, so these sort of maybe objective forms of reality, but also human responses like ways of speaking and moving, eye tracking, blood flow, breathing, heart rate, um, all of which I'm thinking about at this moment. <laughs> Thanks to advanced video processing like MIT's or Lurian video magnification, all these can be actually done using video. Uh, even historical video of subjects long dead. So it's possible to actually, with this kind of amplification, understand the specific subjective physiological state of somebody experiencing something historically, almost like resurrect those experiences. For a few hundred dollars now, even invisible maps of your brain waves can be tracked and indexed with actions. So immediate access to catalogs of every definable quanta of reality broadens our own imagination, of course, but it also allows the augmentation of our imagination through machine intelligence. So just as verbal interactions of Siri and Alexa feel more real because they draw on trillions of actually human uttered word structures, we can draw on these recorded experiences um, to expand how we think about and organize that data. So. Um, the work of our office is currently considering how to train machine vision neural nets to dream of new assemblages and phantasmagorias of architecture from this endless online visual catalog. Fragments of um, new and old sensory uh, elements can be stitched together um, into novel states. Consider the design of a plan. By programming vision-enabled bots to scan and synthesize billions of figure ground shapes and building plans, we can apply data science techniques to make explicit the formal associations and affinities across the entire corpus of buildings. Uh, in effect, we can be, begin to map out in a sort of a posteriori way all the particulars of, uh, of architecture and create um, maps which are totally objective in the sense that they encompass all subjectivities. Um, so 
these, so such maps recall a specific moment of maritime mapping in the age of discoveries when the then unknown became not a sphere of pure speculation, but instead a bounded and dimension range yet to be explored. So the second image uh, I'd sort of call to mind is a map uh, of some unknown islands. As new islands were spied, the areas known were painstakingly rendered. Uh, but those unknown were no longer populated with the fantastic beasts which occupied, say, medieval maps, uh, but uh, painstakingly, um, uh, but painstaking, sorry, uh, they were no longer populated with fantastic beasts, but delineated with measured precision for later explorers. So essentially you have this cordon which says, okay, this is the undiscovered territory. Terra incognita is thereby dimensioned. Uh, so by uh, mapping the territory of experience form, not only, uh, we can not only plot the world of existing buildings, but we can also reveal this terra incognita of design. So uh, of course, beyond cataloging our own human experiences, we occupy a world of enchanted objects and lively machines who themselves see in very particular ways. These multiple subjectivities, which have already been alluded to, can now be indexed and exchanged. Every sensorium, including those of machines and animals, correspond to particular identities, and those identities, through their experiences, are also now exchangeable. Uh, this isn't so new in its own right. Julius uh, Neunbronner's early uh, aerial photos from the early 20th century were quite literally views from animal eyes with cameras attached directly to the bodies of pigeons. In their piece, Animal Superpowers, the experimental inter interaction, uh, a group of experimental interaction designers from Royal College of Art de developed a series of prosthetic attachments to experience the sensory of an ant, giraffe, or bird. And the point is that with all of that, with the information essentially collected from those experiences, those are entirely portable, um, uh, portable and refactorable experiences. So we exchange experiences not only with animals, but also, or sorry, not only with machines, but also, well, not only with animals, but also with machines. Electro-optical devices see distinct spectra and sediments of reality. Uh, the machine versions of reality are digitally cataloged and exchanged online alongside the overlapping uh, and interdependent human version of reality. So what does it mean for freedom when every possible experience of every living thing and every non-living thing exists uh, in a localizable and quantifiable spectrum? What happens when experience is reproducible on demand? Architectural spaces that heighten or excite the senses may become less distinct and engaging, while those that uh, neutralize the senses uh, could become correspondingly more precious. Uh, or we may deliberately search for a more immediate and ecstatic version of reality, this maybe shamanistic version of reality, which is idiosyncratic, unconventional, frustrates reproduction, but is ultimately our own. Or these desires might, in fact, intersect. So contrast the super amplification and super abundance of this exhaustive catalog, ex catalog of experience that we've mentioned uh, with the sensory deprivation chamber, a kind of coffin, a hermetic horizon of sensation. The deprivation chamber was originally designed as a way to test the limits of the subjective construction of experience in the absence of empirical stimuli. So the question was, if nothing stimulated the brain, would you cease to think? Uh, perhaps the earliest instance of this intensified non-experience was the dark retreat. An advanced practice of certain strains of Tibetan Buddhism, the dark retreat uh, is pursued over the course of days or weeks in a chamber absolutely devoid of light, or conversely, in a plenum of darkness. After a period of days, the meditant begins to see spontaneous visions of light auras with greater and greater semantic articulation. Uh, quote, the meditant sees emptiness with all aspects everywhere, unproduced phenomenon uh, that are like prognostic images in a mirror. Uh, he considers these as dream objects, distinct uh, appearances elaborated uh, by the mind, close quote. So, you know, in this, in the absence of this, um, or this, this 96% essentially begins to construct uh, a reality composed entirely uh, of light. So, quote, some studies have focused on inducing similar imagery in subjects with intact visual systems by placing them in total visual deprivation, a context that would mimic that of the dark retreat. A blindfolded exper blindfolding experiment uh, conducted at Harvard Medical School, for instance, uh, placed 13 subjects in specially constructed blindfolds that allowed the eyes to move freely but blocked all light. The subjects remained blindfolded for five days and were given tape recorders to allow them to document their experiences. 
Unsurprisingly, the reports of the blindfolded subjects correlate closely with the literary accounts of visionary experiences in dark retreat. The onset of visual experiences as unstructured spots or patches of light uh, called phosphenes, from which many subjects eventually turned into complex, realistic experiences like peacock feathers, faces, and architecture. Close quote. Um, so what is yet inaccessible in this digital cataloging is that element of vision which feels inescapably vis vivid and viscerally um, uh, precise uh, because it's so singular, unconstructed, and bizarre. It's this distinction between measured vision and visionary ecstasy. Uh, so vision evokes a measured architectural drawing, the technical apparatus of augmented vision or machine vision. Visions invoke... Uh, evoke reveries of a super or super reality. And I thought it was sort of evocative that in fact the first session today was all, was Angavanta visions, these sort of, um, you know, potentially ecstatic notions of what architecture could be. Um, in his rare and bizarre book, quote, What Heaven Looks Like, close quote, bear with me for a second, <laughs> the art theorist uh, James Elkin provides an idiosyncratic but rich view of one catalog of visions. He offers a tour of, quote, 52 uh, small, round watercolor paintings based on the visions um, an anonymous 17th century painter saw in the ends of firewood logs, close quote. So picture, if you will, this artist with an end of a log strapped to uh, his or her eyes like a Microsoft HoloLens uh, in the throes of ecstatic vision, almost the exact opposite of a few dozen portraits of constructed vision of Panini's modern room. Elkins ventures a coda for these paintings, and indeed a challenge to the uh, ecstatic limits of our digital library of Babel. Quote, in alchemical books, there are pictures of people who walk without feet. Uh, they represent the final stage in, alchem in an alchemist's quest, that he's nearly fixed in place, but still needs to move a bit further. He's showing us something we cannot copy, the trick of walking without feet on threads of lightning. Um, this pseudoscopic nature, or pseudocosmic nature, breathing and moving, dangerous and tantalizing, immediately at hand, and utterly inaccessible, close quote. So I think as part of this panel, we're searching for that which is potentially still a bit inaccessible, but hopefully we're getting somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my turn, I suppose, uh, one after the other. Um, I'd like to start with a mantra. Let's be realistic and try the impossible. That was uh, something I heard over and over again through my architectural upbringing in the master class of Wolf Briggs. And um, it, um, it also is, um, well, it, I remembered it um, um, again because um, we are talking here or we were supposed to think about and talk about the non-ordinary reality and I think that um, realism and um, the impossible is a good combination of trying to go beyond or just to think what could be, for example, in the future. That was what I was always interested in. I was always interested in how would we live in the future and what kind of societal um, relationships we would have and what kind of architectural spaces. So um, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about my practice, uh, which is in a very tangible uh, way. And um, um, I'd like to start with um, maybe, um, first of all, one uh, important aspect of um, the while well, creating a non-ordinary reality, I think, is um, starting off with the people, bringing the right people together, uh, bringing an interdisciplinary team together. It's uh, very important. I might be sitting here, but uh, over there, for example, is uh, one of uh, Liquifer partners, um, well, Liquifer partners, René Vaclavicek. So we have uh, a lot of different um, people, architects, engineers, scientists, and uh, all the projects for space exploration we do is always within this contextual setting of a very interdisciplinary um, work and working very closely together with space engineers, uh, with um, microbial scientists, uh, with um, you know, synthetic biology, but also um, with uh, material scientists. 
um, and, um, and other structural engineers. The, um, the projects we are concerned with, they all have to do with a non-ordinary reality in that sense that we look at environments which are very different from the environment we are here um, today in this room. Um, so we are used to one G, one gravity. What does it mean? We are pulled uh, with our body, you know, towards the center of the earth. We have a certain kind of posture. We move uh, according to this gravitational force and all our buildings, all our spaces are according to that. So when we look closely, you know, in this particular space, it's all about the, the horizontal plane and we step one, you know, one step upon each other and then we can climb into other orbits. Um, the, um, what is particularly interesting to us is the, of course, the, the other kind of environments which are very close from here. They are um, just, let's say, 100 kilometers from here. It's, uh, you ju we just have to think in another axis. It's, if we think in the set axis, then we are suddenly in zero gravity. We are levitated, we are floating, and everything changes for us. So it's, it's an experience, and I think Sanford mentioned it at the beginning. It's the, the, you know, it's, it would be transgressing the, the limit of our known experience in our, with our body and the way we perceive spaces. So zero gravity is, is truly interesting, because if we imagine we would be floating here now, um, well, some of us or all of us would be probably terribly sick, but um, apart from that, we would be also, you know, we would feel maybe as if we would be on drugs or so. So very um, light, uh, we could float at every corner, we would use up much less space than we have and we would use up here. We would maybe be much closer together um, and um, we probably would uh, also talk to each other, you know, with the head tilted 100 deg degrees in the other direction. If we could hear each other because of these like really loud noise of the life support systems, we, we would need. Um, so, you know, Earth is this kind of huge biosphere which keeps us alive, which creates this um, life support system um, around us and uh, which just, you know, enables our living, gives us uh, oxygen, water and uh, food, uh, then, you know, Everything outside, of course, has this kind of, we, we then start living in a, in a truly technologized space. It's all the machine around us. And the interesting part is, if we think further and further, is how much this machine can become part of us and how much um, this kind of whole environment, or we could kind of um, merge with this environment. So the, the projects we are working on are quite, um, I would say, tangible in that sense. They are part of uh, fundamental research. One of it is, for example, the uh, she habitat. It's a self-deployable habitat for extreme environments. Uh, and it's made, it's built for Earth. It's the first European transformable habitat simulator. It's made for Earth to train future astronauts or to train astronauts for future missions on the Moon and Mars. So a lot of uh, things we, you know, when we, and probably, you know, trying to find this ordinary reality, uh, non-ordinary reality, and, and going into that kind of realm is also about learning and training. So uh, one aspect is with this habitat is that we can you know, simulate Moon or Mars missions um, and how it would be to live in such a space within this, you know, techno technological frame. Another uh, project uh, which is very different and that also touches in the extension of the, probably of the architectural profession, that is um, a project which has to do with sintering building elements, interlocking building, building elements uh, through an additive layer manufacturing process um, for the moon using only the lunar sand, the moon sand and the sun in a concentrated manner 
to uh, create these, these elements, so using local resources to, to build these habitats. And um, this is, I mean, all these endeavors, uh, projects are, of course, with partners such as the German Aerospace Center um, or the um, Bollinger Kromann or COMEX um, company who builds um, subsea habitats. So all this expertise comes together to create um, this kind of, these, these prototypes. But um, the actual, I say, creation and conceptualization of this project, of course, is beyond what we can um, today imagine. Well, we can imagine, but we cannot experience it. Um, and I think this is creating this kind of um, a reality which um, we, we would probably call, or which could be suited to be called non-ordinary reality. Uh, good afternoon. So um, I'm going to be presenting some of the ideas that are contained within my project called the Interopera. Um, but the, the framework for it is the following. Um, don't take the elevator, take the stairs. Framing, looping, and projecting in the quantum. So the Interopera is a science fiction romance about an imploding star hosting a quantum alien race that engages the planet Earth as a bank point to ricochet into another projected dimensional reality. A bank point is a term in snooker that refers to the specific angle of incidence that is calculated to ricochet a pool ball as it impacts the pool table's cushion and thereby redirecting it to a new reality. I've been particularly preoccupied with invest investigating the bank point as a strategy for moving between realities, assuming for me that reality as we've come to know it gains its tour de force by simultaneously existing here now and in another universe that relies on the former to bank itself into another. The idea here and now, then, is not to think of two realities or more, but accept that infinite realities do not exist in the same temporality whatsoever, but do, not rather, but do rather exist a priori through a quantum dimensional banking or banking system. Banking needs to be understood in the field of quantum, where all totalities and subtotalities are capable of swapping particles for flows. I know this is a little bit abstract because it's related to um, David Baum and that's outside the purview of me describing the overall concept of quantum. However, bank points de-link the particles of the former with the flow of the latter. This is important for two reasons. The idea that you are here and not elsewhere is only true insofar as you either bank to another reality or you do not. Uh, the second point, and the second reason, is that the way in which our disciplines are contained inside their meta-territorial imperative has and still is almost impossible to cut through them. It keeps us from banking and interchanging particles and flows. It's a form of taxonomy that obliterates the quantum relational dynamics between science, poetry, philosophy, literature, mathematics, biology, and fiction. These containers have destroyed our discursive souls and their cognitive dexterity. The interopera is the operational system that braids together alien and earthling spirit molecules. The merger produces the necessary dexterity in order to jump through a bank point. For it is one thing to see a bank point, and it is another thing to move through it. This, these in my estimated capacity as the inventor and purveyor of a new reality mine shaft, a rabbit hole if you will, consists of operational drawings, uh, 3D prints, objects, sound, video, interoper rooms that present filaments from the totality of, let's just say, my universe. These are guided through the sequel, sequence portal by a series of texts that I've written as the interoper reader, which is an excerpt from a longer manuscript that streams 24 character narratives through a non-linear linked set of chapters, each which express a reality stream that slide like ships in the night across their two-dimensional port and starboard sides. The interopera, short for interoperability, is a poetic accounting of an ever-evolving quantum philosophy that is both bookended by a gothic tale on the one hand and a sci-fi matrix terminator ghost in the shell arrival blended with Blade Runner, Lucy, and various other engines of science fiction from the cinema. Essentially, my interoperability, uh, interoper 
attic reality is a palindrome that stretches across the surface of linguistics and operates outside the closure of the finite. Framing, looping, and projecting. These are the three triad pieces that get me to the quantum field that I'm more or less researching. Um, the move towards multidimensionality is thus. The interoper is a sequencing generator, a quantum filter induction engine that pushes an alien race 5,000 years from now through the needle of a reality using Earth as a bank shot to ricochet through to another dimension. The bank shot has been used before. Shakespeare used the foil as a literary device to bank a character's sediments that cannot be held in the queue of the primary character, but is given a voice by another character banked across a dialogical array of language that keeps enough distance like J.W. Winnicott's transitional object, the foil is that then, and reality can handle all of this, at least in theory. And I quote from the reader, you are everything and nothing at the same time, but if you are in two places at once, then you are everything and nothing in one place, and nothing and everything in another. Dynamic regulation and deregulation. Reality, then, is a sham. It's lingo even worse still. A palindrome of bank grammatology hurling insults in the days before psychological modernity and the birth of what Jacques Le Goff called confession is the birth of public introversion. Regulation is limbic. Deregulation is catastrophic. Framing, SimCity 1. The quantum, then, is against the pushing agents in SimCity and their attendant Monte Carlo methods that express the randomness of life itself. A tree falls, hits a hydro wire, does a halo, high altitude, low opening landing on a mound of raked leaves, and then combusts, and a fire truck comes and puts out the fire, etc., etc., etc. Framing 2, the calling of St. Matthew. Caravaggio's The Calling of St. Matthew frames the local pulse of light against the imported chiaroscuro of white light that chalks up reality to be truncated by the vexed spectral vector of illumination. Scripts melt into puddles of dark red blood rubber and the slippers of Cinderella hang, blackened by Louise Bourgeois, down from the ceiling into the steel shoring below the grade of reality, holding a hydraulic plate of gold with a holographic projection of a science experiment gone awry. This is hollow movement then, and reality is drenched, soaked, and people are super glued to the grid. Da Vinci cleanses his fist around the octahedron, blades cutting through his palm, and in terror we all follow the cinematic projector as it bakes its images onto the screen. Resurrected by Timothy Leary's retinal circus and the pre-launch of, of psychedelic experience, Hendrix and David Dalton enter a hotel room in Marrakesh in 1968. The room is filled with a bunch of random guests roosting between bike rides and sweat. This is not the bed of wear at the Victorian Albright at all. A projected par lamp piercing at sunset through Mondrian's holiday, one simultaneity is game over in the after all. Excerpt from the Interoper Reader, Prologue. Thus spoke the thermal sensorium in the choir hall of liquid voices as they dripped milky moisture down the fluting of the Gothic columns choking on her ancient dynasty of love and hunger. Chapter one, the meeting. Above the table were three large candelabra made of human bones fashioned with titanium pins. Shakespeare was being spoken, voices of God were heard. Chapter two, alone. Rogue entities altered the time sequencing of the event horizons and rerouted all the entities' motion pathways into infinity. The evil takes its hold, trouble brews there and then. Chapter two, and locomotion. Locomotion is the end of it all. It produces the fathomless depths of the other. The end is near, so is the beginning. The palindrome of life's sculpted words at the brink, so is the beginning, so is the end of the beginning. Scattered across the hull of an alien mothership, interoperating between flows and fields, particles and flow become interchangeable. Chapter three, first attack. Her left eye looked into the future. Her right eye looked into the past. Ember and Bento became the duet's love of multiverse destroying anything from their path towards quantum entanglement and teleportation. This was magic, it was killer. Looping, Atlantis. I awake then. I awake underwater and yet I am breathing. My spine inverse molded and crafting an alien curvature nesting in its longitudinal surface, anything superficial. I am breathing. It's the fall of Atlantis. Massive pieces of capitals, bases, shafts, pediments, planetary gears, catapults, and love spears are falling into the water, bypassing all around me like silent bullets breaking ballistic turbulence with the magic of water and its liquid. I pulled, I pulled back my crossbow and looped it through the quill along the arrow slit 
love spears in my pack, off the grid, I'm in Atlantis. Chapter 6, Ember. Ember was the gift of the inner opera, a space made of gold punctured by love's light, powered by her chrome throat, bound together by Bento's flaming genetic adhesive. She was at once logical and divine, trapped and free, soft and yet impenetrably hard. Chapter 7, Linearity. She collected these erotic assaults on the mind with a dagger and hard disk half strapped on top of both Romeo and Juliet's backs. And every now and then she would ship off a file to Dakota like rationing food to a wild animal. Chapter 8, The Never Entrance. Where the age of the reasonable desperately controlled the faceted crystals on the brink of retreating from the continuous flow of being as a deposit of life that is constantly becoming. A comb is bent. Chapter 9, The Enfolded. Then things fell apart and together again, vaporized into a mist of white sparkler lights, bending space into a multidimensional unfolding consciousness of enfolding. Chapter 11, The Monte Carlo. Reality was no longer dependent on the inertial frame conducted by single beings, but became operational as an entire whole in which the universe was capable of, blinding, of binding fluids and solids without points of special relativity. Projecting love's knowingness. Reality seeps into our pores and mixes with our blood. Our blood then surges through our hearts, modulated by different beats, making its way into our brains, and it changes the way we think about life. I think about love. The present interacts with ourselves, Two schooners from the 17th century come up beside each other in the middle of the sea. The crews exchange ancient wooden crates filled with unknown riches. The exchange of new cargo induces a beautiful feeling of something new that has arrived on deck. Lives are changed forever. Reality becomes a game of prying open the treasures of the soul. The future has no mercy. It deepens the flow of wonder and preys on the evolution of the hungry like a hawk diving with its claws onto its prey in the forest of forgotten dreams. We collapse there. Love infuses the boundary between the death of one and the rebirth of another. Blood, ships, and prey crisscross across the centuries, entangled threads and begin to make logic that intertwines with the new surface. New fluidity and boundaries begin to take shape. The two are excited by the arrival of a new portal in the universe. A new universe. Something goes awry. History begins to influence the shape of stars. The present is called upon to translate its constellations. The future starts to disappear into the mist of the unknown. Attachment figures at the edge of an invisible energy that melds their bodies. They put stakes in the ground, in an open field, and begin to exchange geometric vows for each other. The world becomes one and open. The abyss. You each recite your wishes. Bridges burn. Ships move on. The forest is empty. Ghost in the shell, a china doll slides across the dining table like an air hockey puck in slow motion. The figure explodes with violent trajectories, her ceramic body starts to break down into drawers, and new figures appear, new mother surfaces, new AI. She's destroyed in the process of decomposition, takes a bullet, a knife, a sword. The inner opera and the new Blade Runner. Kay lies down on the shallow steps of a brutal building in the midst of a snow-covered nowhere. He laments, he, he laments his existence like the acrobat did in Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Darzusha. In a puddle of blood, lamenting his downfall from the high wire active above the town square, he says, quite on the contrary, you picked a life of reality of danger, and I shall bury you with my own hands. The merger. When the aliens merged with the humans in Dante's Inferno multiplied, so did the way in which we implanted our souls into the loom of reality. Total sum. It's a game of partitioning then, knowing how to keep the partitions in place and resist the poche of the mastering grid, stay open, keep your bandwidth, become someone who you are and who you are not, take the elevator, don't take the elevator, take the stairs. Chapter 59, Implicate Destruction. Galactic angels projected their halos into perfect weapons that could release us from the hold of evil on us. Nothing was in control now. Angels falling into a hole. Words would change, but names would never alter. Beckett. So too was it in ways in which we would become oneness. Chapter 60, The Opening. You are everything and nothing at the same time, but you are two places. If you are at two places at once, then you are everything and nothing in one place, and nothing and everything in another. Nothing could be farther from the truth then. Reality is a fixed container, a precision agriculture, interchangeable at all scales between flow and particle, such as it is, was, and would become. Reality is a royal mess. It does not hold up against the specter 
arc of knives in flight, the world is stitched into vortical valleys that cease to need environmental stability to buttress framing, looping, and projecting perturbations. Don't take the elevator, take the stairs. Okay. So I'm so happy about the lay the, the lineup here. I think that works pretty well. So far. I, I'm going to have to play the straight man today for sure. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, well, I don't know what we have. Do we have about uh, 20 minutes? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so anyone in the audience who has a question <clears throat> ought to signal to us gently and discreetly that you that that exists. So y you could shut me up. I don't have a lot really to say right now. I, I want to ask some very basic questions. Uh, it strikes me that what I heard today most of our panelists have leveraged, if I can use that word, some of the opportunities available in our culture in order to move away from a reality if there in fact is one. That's to say, is there something there or is there just any old thing out there and we can make of it what we want? Now, uh, that there's no particular moral reading in that, even though I can't help do it. Uh, clearly, there were nuances that spilled out. But nonetheless, it's an interesting question to ask. And I'd like to, want, on one level, put that on the table. And that is to say, because, I mean, maybe today, growing up in today's world, it, one is rarely uh, uh, led to ask oneself that question, is there something out there? that requires respect, shall we say, or at least to be honored <laughs> with. Um, uh. So the question I want to ask is, some move away, some have used the opportunities, the rhetorical opportunities, the conceptual opportunities, to move away from, let's say, what some would call a fascistic mono-reality uh, that is, say, fed to us, uh, and others, maybe, at least one, um, is, well, let me ask it this way. Do, does, do any of you, and please speak up as you like, do any of you feel that opportunities, especially the most sophisticated ones that are presenting themselves to us today, offer uh, ways to rediscover the realities that make us up, let's say, as, a his, as historical creatures and as biological entities. You know, the cultural argument, and I come from a cultural studies background, the cultural argument seems, if I may say so, tired to myself, uh, but interesting to hear uh, how you guys respond to it. I would also since there's not a lot of time, I'd like to say some of the great, the, some of the great lines I just heard in Boygon's thing is, reality is a sham, uh, a science experiment gone awry. Reality is a royal mess. I, I, uh, the loom of reality into which we try, successfully or not, to weave ourselves. I say everyone here would agree with that, I would imagine, but it would mean something different to each of us. So does anyone want to pick up a comment to something you heard, uh, something that provoked you, uh, and maybe even anyone want to confess to thinking about things perhaps in a slightly different way after hearing what some of your other colleagues have presented. This is where you wait and you let the silence work. Let me percolate. I see you're ready to go. I just have a very brief comment. So I think this question of sort of like a unitary reality is a very, is a very interesting one. Um, and in particular, this idea that I sort of tried to suggest is that there might, there might be a distinction or like a third way between this notion of a specific, almost like a priori unitary reality and complete sort of like solipsism and subjectivity. And it's this notion that it's possible to aggregate all of those subjectivities 
and create a sort of relational but complete and unequivocal understanding of how reality is experienced. And I think that's something which is, which is different and new, which is only made possible through the kind of collection technologies, essentially, that we, um, uh, essentially that we have today. Uh, so it's, it's possible to create this sort of like, I don't know, quantized empathy to understand in a very comprehensive way how everyone could experience reality and then localize within that sort of triangulate, if you will, what, that, um, what the underlying reality might be, or at least characterize it in such a way which is more, um, more bounded. Can I say something weird right now? Please. Is listening to you, it's wonderful. I cannot imagine in a million years you talking to Frank Gehry like that. I, I, I want to remind you, those who couldn't hear that well, is uh, Andrew was... You know, it all, it always comes back to haunt me. <laughs> well, the head of Gary Technologies for, the, for, for quite a long time worked on some you know, extraordinary buildings, worked out the math, shall we say, the experiential uh, modalities. Uh, but I just can't imagine. So I would love for you to maybe elaborate a bit on um, how these concerns and thoughts make their way into your practice. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a very interesting question about um, how we might... So I alluded th to this in my presentation, but I think there's a very interesting possibility today to map in a much more exhaustive and comprehensive way what we mean by design. So it's possible, I think, with um, not only our data collection capacities, but our ability to sort of aggregate, um, process, and interweave that information, that we can construct a kind of like portrait of what design really is, at least the way that it's been practiced over the last few hundred years, and maybe in the way it's, it's practiced in, uh, in a contemporary context. And that portrait um, is something which is constructed from billions of subjectivities, essentially. We begin to sort of like triangulate a kind of topography of what design is. It's, it's an ob kind of an objective thing in the sense that no particular subjectivities outside of that network. Every specific perspective is accurately and precisely and completely represented. Uh, but it's also, um, you know, it, it, it represents something which is somehow objective in the sense that everybody sees it in, um, everybody participates in the construction of that. So I think mapping, I don't know, mapping the possibility of design in that way is a very interesting, it's one of the very interesting potentials. Um, today, and in particular, beginning to identify where are these areas which are yet unexplored. Um, that's a sort of corollary of that exhaustive mapping. So one thing that this conversation made me think about is that maybe, I don't know, maybe this book exists, maybe multiple books about this exist, but I I kind of feel a need that, you know, we're um, a lot of us were referring to uh, various um, uh, technologically related um, virtualizations of reality, but I'm thinking, you know, uh, in my practice um, over the past few years, I've been thinking about other virtualizations, for example, virtualization of money and virtualization of labor. And I decided to kind of get back to where this virtualization started. What are the kind of analog antecedents of this virtualizations? And now, like, listening to this uh, conversation and, and your presentations, I was thinking that maybe it's interest it would be interesting unless you know of such a book, but, I, but maybe there's something still to be written about where did like what where in the analog world uh, various places this did this virtualizations that we're talking about started you know like one uh, just like off the top of my head uh, which probably is not like a typical example but just one thing you know like for example Bruce Sterling talks about this atemporal objects so he talks for example about a um, uh, hero from Alexandria and his inventions such as the the um, uh, the steam uh, turbine that was the fastest revolving object of the ancient world and it was basically the the, the first world first uh, gadget and basically it had no application in the surrounding world it was just a gadget like a toy it was the yeah just the fastest revolving sphere and people just looked at it but it took like 2,000 years before it found an application as a steam engine and like actually Sterling has this whole genealogy of things that exceeded their times in such a way that they were completely abstracted atemporal and 
I mean, in a way, virtual and their like disconnection from from their surrounding reality. And I, um, yeah, I think that, that it would be actually an interesting, you know, subject to think about where in very analog histories uh, of uh, society, architecture, anywhere. Uh, it started, you know, this virtualizer, like maybe thousands of years ago. Well, I, you know, one of the things that also struck me about your comments were the, the notion of a phantom and a phantom object and this idea of a doppelganger and this notion that that phantom itself can have a kind of reality and also a kind of subjectivity. And I think increasingly we live sort of phantom lives, our objects live phantom lives, our entire sort of like physical reality has a phantom life which is which consists of data and this sort of like phantom reality I think is a really, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of the ghosts that sort of like in, exists in this conversation. What's kind of interesting with uh, where everybody stands in their um, maybe relation to reality, it seems everybody's uncomfortable with reality. Um, and um, well, I guess with the assumption of what reality is. Um, it, it's challenged, um, you know, by uh, social media platforms, how we experience it. It's challenged with our perception. It's challenged with our relationship to this earth, to this atmosphere. It's challenged with our fantasy. Um, and I think that's uh, kind of really crucial uh, for a discipline uh, where we are expected to be realistic. Uh, we're expected to kind of engage uh, the material forces, uh, the financial forces that uh, allow us, well, want us to imagine kind of a future. Um, and I think there's kind of a resistance to that notion of uh, what is it seemed to be real uh, that is being uh, kind of questioned, challenged, and shows me the impossibility that uh, kind of a singular monoconstruction of uh, what reality is, is is just impossible undesirable at the same time. Well, you know, that was a uh, straw man. But I'm, I recall, I mean, I remember, based on an invocation that Brian made about uh, Donald Winnicott, when Winnicott uh, asked, or I mean, he asked it both, you know, conceptually, but also literally to his children, patients. His, he said, did you find that, or no, did you, make that up or did you find it in the world? And his argument was that yes, well the title of the book was collected as Playing and Reality, but his idea was that there was a sweet spot between both mm. where what you, what real, what is real and what you can manipulate and transform are in continual contact with one another. Sure. Uh, this was a sweet spot for creative work, sure. um, but it seems to me we are, this is part of the ecological crisis perhaps that we experience right now, is our environment has, has very powerfully moved us away from what it would consider that toxic place yeah. where we are free to mix the two in ways that serve us. So I wonder, you know, the Winnicott me come back uh, in that way. And I, I ask in a way because, you know, reality is something that has to be transformed. And yet, can we completely abandon the idea of an a priori reality? You know, my, okay, please. Space, I love it. You know, honestly, I want you to know that you were the person I referred to who was moving toward reality rather than away from it. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way here on the panel. Um, no, I just because, you know, comfortable with reality or uncomfortable with reality, I think that reality, virtuality, that there's a duality and it has always existed. It just comes with humans. So it's a natural part of it. And um, we might, you know, since we started using uh, technologies, um, then, you know, we will always, you know, somehow go further in progress and then, you know, merge these or, or make, let's say, make these virtu virtualities or augmented realities just more intricate and more, more detailed. But, but I think it's not a, a matter of, you know, here's reality and then here is 
virtuality or non-ordinary reality. I think it's, it's just part of our existence. And we just uh, very smoothly transform from, from one condition to the other. And of course, uh, maybe reality is more something which we are caught in for, let's say, 99% of our life. But we always strive into going, you know, into experiencing this non-ordinary part of reality. If it's, you know, if it, it was, a, a, you know, expeditioners in the in in the in the 19th century, or if it's if it's us now trying, you know, to bring um, space tourism um, to everybody, I think it's always this kind of same. Um, or it always has been there, so sure. it's not a this no, or I mean, that. Uh, 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 kind of. Uh, um, Uncomfortable was used in a really positive way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to know. Un uncomfortable being positive. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think one of the biggest changes today, Agnieszka, I think, you know, in your work, uh, the whole social field of architecting relational dynamics is with the user base, not anywhere near as it used to be dependent on an external, you know, reality principle to augment it. Our author. Right. So to me, um, I guess if, you, if I was to identify a place, getting back to your question just mm -hmm. at the beginning of this opening, um, I would say that the, 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 a key moment for me is the transposition of um, private space and public by the development and launch of the Sony Walkman and the four track cassette. Mm -hmm. So when you have obviously technology companies that produce products that need content and all the rest of it. We know all those stories and they're basically lame and non-interesting, relevant here, I don't think, to this reality. But the, the, when technology um, converts into a kind of reified environment of distribution that's, that's accessible by the user base and they get to kind of generate their own material, et cetera, and the distribution mm -hmm. systems extenuate into this new social media field that we're all familiar with that you're basing a lot of your discourse on. I think that that's where the critical point is between analog and digital that one has to kind of really study carefully to see what the carriers are going to look like into the future, if you even want to sure. think about the future. Sure, but I actually my question was about things that are more, much more analog. I know I totally agree with you, but I was like kind of trying to withdraw from technology and think like 2,000 years ago, you know, like yeah. uh, because I think that there is an antecedent to, to the Walkman, which is the telephone, which Sanford was referring to in the, this description of this conference, uh, that there was a certain uh, instance of virtualization. But what if we look like, I don't know, in the 16th century? I mean, you were talking about this deprivation chambers. I found it very interesting because obviously this thinking was, is a very old, like a, yeah, so this actually made me think like, what are other instances of this, like things that happened, you know, 1500 years ago, or I don't know, 500 years ago that are not related, maybe some of them are related to technology as it was back then, but some of them are be related to certain social constructs, to some, you know, I'm sure there's tons, you know, it's like, and I wonder if there's, I don't know, it's an open question if anybody can tell me if there's a good book, probably like there are some anthropologists looking into this. I like the fact you think the answers are in books still. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we have one question from the audience, from Sam yeah. Owinger. Actually, I would like um, to question you at first. I also had really the feeling that it was very nice to see how different you were moving away or towards reality. I completely had the feeling when you were talking, you were actually really, by just making us aware of and thinking of that actually the conditions we are living in are producing a kind of set of movements, apparatus, how we operate. And actually I also wanted to mention the Walkman thing, but I actually wanted to mention the next technology in that type of way when we run around with bone conduction, where we don't have to close out the world at the same time, because this is actually the, the whole thing, and, and this is actually coming from the Walkman, I wanted to ask you why you so insist so much on the term virtual reality instead of media reality, because I think it's a quite a, it's really a distance, because when I move around on the planet and come to different cultures or different social systems, I all them realize, especially from an auditory point of view, that, let's say it like this, the way how reality comes towards me in the discussions, in the way what I encounter, it's completely based on the media what's used. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that was a question, but you know, because I got to be the moderator today and not a panelist, I have a, uh, I have a, I have a, uh, was that me? 
I have a a political pro <laughs> Ooh, you know, I was about to say, well, what I want to say is I have the last word. I get to impose uh, a final uh, thought, uh, absolutely undeserved, and that is I feel personally that the future of um, uh, human expansion is on the stairs and not in the elevator. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>